Hello everyone. I have here a 700 page volume titled The Basic Writings of Bertrand Russell. What is nice about this volume is that it contains a large number of essays covering a very wide variety of topics, including psychology, education, religion, metaphysics, philosophy, and there are some autobiographical essays in the beginning of this collection, and some even some essays about writing. So one part of this book is called Philosophy of Education, and that part begins with this short chapter, which is simply called Education. My plan for this video is to read a little bit from this chapter, read a few passages, and maybe provide some additional commentary. Before I begin, I should mention that uh, Russell begins this chapter by talking about not ideals of education, but how education is actually thought about and used, the role of education in society uh, at the time. And even now. <laughs> so let's begin. Education is, as a rule, the strongest force on the side of what exists and against fundamental change. Threatened institutions, while they are still powerful, possess themselves of the educational machine and instill a respect for their own excellence into the malleable minds of the young. So we can divide the four social, cultural, political forces into two groups group that is in favor of maintaining the status quo and the group that is opposed to the status quo and wants to change. And education is usually, according to Russell, as a rule, it is a force, it becomes a force on the side of the forces that want to maintain the status quo. And the way that works is that they, they instill that educational machinery, it instills beliefs about the excellence of the institutions, people, ideas that are currently in power instilled beliefs about their excellence, that they are excellent, that they are in power because they are good. Let's continue. The children themselves are not considered by either party, by either side of those, those, uh, those groups of forces. They are merely much material to be recruited into one army or the other. If the children themselves were considered, education would not aim at making them belong to this party or that but at enabling them to choose intelligently between the parties. So rather than giving them op opinions, giving them beliefs that are presumably the right kinds of beliefs, education would give them the capacity to decide and form new beliefs, form their opinions intelligently. And uh, this reminded me of, it's very easy to detect the students or young people who were brought up in the systems, educational systems that aim to give them opinions give them beliefs, give them beliefs about the excellence of certain ideas, certain institutions. Those students who are already trained in that system with that approach, they always feel shocked and surprised and a little bit helpless when they are confronted with decision, with the, with the necessity of making a decision. When they realize that there are situations in which a decision is genuinely necessary for the, for the situation, for an event to move forward. Uh, they, because they always want to, they always assume that there is a right decision, that the, the decision by, by a right decision we mean that an answer only has to be found or be given by someone, removing the necessity of a genuine decision. But education as, I'm continuing, uh, but education as a political institution endeavors to form habits and to circumscribe knowledge in such a way as to make one set of opinions inevitable. So what is an alternative? What would an education look like that does not yield inevitable or seemingly inevitable opinions? The question is, um, I think most important question is, would that kind of educational approach involve no authority on, from the part of the teacher? Would the teacher would say, just explore to the students, just do whatever you want, learn whatever you want, because I want to train you to become good decision makers, so I'm not going to teach you anything. I'm not going to have any authority over you. Is that the, the right way? And I think Russell responds negatively to that question. said, no. So we continue. Authority in education is to some extent unavoidable. So some authority has to come in. And those who educate have to find a way of exercising authority in accordance with the spirit of liberty. So it is possible for authority to embody the spirit of liberty or for the spirit of liberty to, to be enacted momentarily for, for a while in terms of an authority, in terms of an imbalance between 
in the relationship between students and teachers. When authority is unavoidable, what is needed is reverence. It is reverence towards others that is lacking in those who advocate machine-made, cast-iron systems. The lack of reverence for the child is all but universal. Reverence requires imagination. By the way, uh, I can add a footnote here saying that this is a very good justification. It's a compelling justification for the role of fiction, and reading fiction, reading good literature, because it enhances imagination. And in, in doing that, it enhances our capacity for reverence. Let's go back to the beginning of that passage. The lack of reverence for the child is all but universal. Reverence requires imagination and vital warmth. It requires most imagination in respect of those who have least actual achievement or power. So students who have not achieved anything yet, they demand from us the, the most amount of the, the biggest exercise of our imagination to do them justice to give them the kind of reverence that they deserve. The child is weak and superficially foolish. The teacher is strong and in an everyday sense wiser than the child. The teacher without reverence or the bureaucratic without reverence easily despises the child for these outward inferiorities. So an attitude that completely lacks imagination, just looking at the brute facts in the, in the relationship between the child and the teacher will have no reverence and will have nothing to give to the child other than an authority. Let's continue. The man who has reverence will not think it is his duty to mold the young. He feels in all that lives, but especially in human beings, and most of all in children, something sacred, indefinable, unlimited, something individual and strangely precious, the growing principle of life, an embodied fragment of that dumb striving of the world. In the presence of a child, he feels an unaccountable humility, a humility not easily defensible on any rational ground, and yet somehow nearer to wisdom than the easy self-confidence of many parents and teachers. Let's read one last passage about the contrast, about how education becomes in actuality. The prevention of free inquiry is unavoidable, so long as the purpose of education is to produce belief rather than thought to compel the young to hold positive opinions on doubtful matters or to go on not detecting that certain matters are doubtful. C certain matters cannot be taken for granted. To compel the young to hold positive opinions on doubtful matters rather than to let them see the doubtfulness and be encouraged to independence of mind. All right. I mean, this is a little bit surprising reading this from Russell in the context of some of his other writings but uh, I liked it. So this is Russell on education and on the importance of reverence in education. Thank you for listening.